from St. Louis, Missouri, an influenced church. We have Pastor Matt McAfee here with us. Matt, come on up here. Love you, dude. Love you, too. Can I get a podium or something? Oh, yeah, sure. Me... Am I on? Can you hear me? What's up, Dina? How you doing? Let's give, it for the, let's give it for the Church 1132 worship team one more time. Where are they at? Weren't they incredible? Yeah, a lot of you. Who was here at D-Now last year? Just raise your hand. Oh, a lot of you. Okay, all right, second timers. I'm so glad you're all here. I'm glad to be back too. Uh, my name is Matt McVie. I'm one of the pastors at Influence Church in St. Louis, Missouri. And I want to introduce you to my wife real quick. Molly, just raise your hand real quick. Everyone say hi to Molly. Molly and I went our first date when I was 14 years old. And I'm 30 now, so 16 years of my life have been with Molly. So how many 14 year olds are in this place today? <laughs> Treat your girlfriend, your boyfriend well, because you might get stuck with them, okay? <laughs> and we have, two, we have two beautiful children. Uh, my little girl, Lucy, who is four years old, with no disrespect to anyone here, but she was the most beautiful little girl that's ever existed in this very parallel universe. And then my son, Miles, is, uh, he is one and a half. Thank you so much. Isn't Cody just the coolest guy that you know? Um, it's okay if I just don't pretend like I have to impress you tonight. I just wanna share from my heart, is that okay? Yeah. I don't wanna just give you a canned message, but I want to give you what I feel the Lord is saying tonight. And whenever you step out on faith, you have to take some risk. Everyone shout risk. risk. Do, you know how faith, do you know how you spell faith? Wrong, wrong. It's spelled R-I-S-K. <laughs> the way that you spell faith is risk. And I had just something in my heart tonight. And can I take a risk, is that okay? All right, young lady, you. Yeah, she, what's your name? Sydney. Sydney, how are you doing? I'm okay. Yeah, I know you're just okay. <laughs> During worship, I looked over at you and I was reminded of a, am I, am I making you uncomfortable? No. Everyone just look at Sydney real quick, make her real uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I, <got it. laughs> um, I could be completely off on this. But when I was looking over at you, I saw, I just happened to glance at you worshiping. And the scripture came to my mind from 2 Chronicles where Jehoshaphat was going into battle. And he was trying to figure out what the best way, what the best strategy was. He had three different, four different armies plotting, conspiring against them. And they fasted and prayed, and Jehoshaphat heard the Lord and said, send a choir, send the worship out in front. And when they began to worship, the armies that had plotted against the kingdom of Israel actually turned against themselves and fought each other instead. In Sydney, I just felt led to share with you, and you can do with whatever you want. Worship will get you through this battle, and it will get you to the next one too. Does that resonate with you? Let's give it up for Ms. Sydney right now. Um, in fact, I don't want to go too Pentecostal tonight, so we'll, uh, I'll dial it back. But can we just pray for Sydney real quick? I don't know what you're going through. But number one, you have a God who has never left you nor forsaken you. You have a God who's never left you nor forsaken you. Though father and mother may leave you, the Bible says, I will never forsake you. You have a church family that loves you. And worship is the way that all the enemies, everything that was sent out against you, to, the Satan that sent to attack you, worship is the way that you'll gain victory through it. Not by your own might. Oh, Sydney, you tried so hard. <laughs> it's almost hard not to cry when you've tried so hard. But it's not by your own might. It's not by your own power. But it's by the spirit of the living God, says the Lord. Did you receive that tonight? Let's give it up to for Jesus one more time tonight. 
Well, I'm so glad to, to, be, to be back. I, it's so fun to see a lot of my new friends. And like Pastor Jake had said, it's, it's really awkward to transition from that into something funny, but we'll, we'll keep on moving, right? As Pastor Jake said, I've known Pastor Jake for a long time and I've known Pastor Jake in many different ways. When Pastor Jake and I first met, he was a student and I was a student, but then he left our school because he thought he was better than us and went to another different school. Them fighting words, Jake, them fighting words. And at one point in Pastor Jake's life, how many people, I, I bet you didn't know this about your pastor, that he actually was a male model. Did you know that? How many people knew that your, your youth pastor, Pastor Jake, was a male model? When he was a senior at Dallas, Dallas, Dallas Baptist University, he actually um, had a great senior picture. It was such a great shot. He was looking away in the distance and he had such a great smile, and he looked so handsome. And then his friend Matt took that picture and began to make memes out of it. And out of that picture, I created a meme called Christian Pickup Blind Charlie. And on Pastor Jake's face, it said things like this, girl, I was looking through the book of numbers and realized I did not have yours. <laughs> what was it? Do you remember another one? I'm not gonna put you on. What's that? Oh, well, I took that meme and put it on a t-shirt for him tonight. <laughs> Pastor Jake, come up here and get this. Give it up for Pastor Jake tonight. <laughs> Who wants to see him wear it on Sunday? Yeah. Love you. It's hilarious. <laughs> All right. Well, I just do that to honor Pastor Jake and Miss Katie, and I'm so glad that you're all here with us tonight. I came to share a word with you, and I'm really honored to kick off this theme that we have called Defy Babylon. Everyone shout Defy Babylon. Defy Babylon. Y'all, I you don't do you didn't do that loud enough. Y'all are rowdy young kids. Let's do that a little louder. Say Defy Babylon. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about because I had the really unique privilege to share with you my heart for this weekend. And I don't know if I ever would give a chance to come back here again. And so tonight, to start off this message, this, this series of this weekend that we're gonna do, I'm gonna start off with, if I could never come back here again, if I were to leave this place today, tonight, and get hit by a car, Pray that doesn't happen, okay? But if, I, if that were to happen, if I was never able to, to share the message of Jesus ever again, here tonight is what I would say to you, is that Jesus is worthy of your all. Jesus is worthy of your all. See, in the Bible times, there's a city called Babylon, and you have three major enemies that are fighting and conspiring against you. You have three major enemies. Number one is the world. The world is the systems that the devil has in place to tempt you and trap you. It's the systems and patterns of this world. This world is a system that leads people to darkness rather than light. It preys on the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Everyone shout the world. Let me say this again. Let me say it another way. The world system is made up by giving you what you want, what you feel, and what you see, especially if that leads you away from Jesus. The next enemy is the flesh. The flesh is your own personal desires that are contrary to the character and nature of God. Have you ever done something not because someone tempted you, but just because you wanted to do it and it was wrong? Don't, come on, don't be shy. I'll raise my hand. Come on. You ever done something that no one had to talk you into that you knew was wrong because you wanted to do it? That's called the flesh. And the one that's pulling the strings behind the world and the flesh is the devil. See, you have a very real enemy. You have a very real enemy that hates you, that despises you, and there's a spider crawling on devil. That was a spider, I'm afraid of spiders. Do y'all get this place sprayed? Okay, just making sure. Because the best way the devil can get back at God is by entrapping people made into his image and keeping them from knowing him. And Babylon was an ancient city 
that you can read about in your Bible. And Babylon was a place where the three streams, the world, the flesh, and the devil all merged together. It was an evil place. Babylon was, Babylon was so evil, it makes Las Vegas look like a McDonald's play place. They were filled with sexual morality. They had no knowledge of God. They did whatever they wanted to do, breaking every single one of God's commandments. And Babylon still exists. It exists in the heart. See, the line between good and evil doesn't separate Republican and Democrat. The line between good and evil doesn't separate denomination and denomination. The line between good and evil doesn't separate this person from that person. The line between good and evil separates us, each one of us, through our hearts. And so when we say defy Babylon, here's what I'm saying is that so many Christians live, live lives that are so content with having one foot in Babylon and one foot in the kingdom. They want, they want the salvation of Jesus, but they also want the pleasures of this world. But Jesus is worthy of your all. He's worthy of your all. And so tonight, with the few remaining moments I have, I want to honor and respect y'all's time. If you have your Bibles, turn over to Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. It'll be on the screens behind me. And if you're brand new to the Bible, the book of Matthew is written by the apostle Matthew, who was an eyewitness to the life and ministry of Jesus. And he's actually recording some parables that Jesus was sharing. Jesus often taught in parables so that we could understand the kingdom of God. Well, the people who want to understand can understand the kingdom of God. And this is what Jesus says in one of his parables. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells, everyone shout with me, all, all he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all, everyone shout all. all. He went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, with your, still you're keeping your finger at Matthew chapter 13, follow me over to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. In this passage of scripture, Jesus is gonna encounter a man who is not quite ready to surrender all. As Jesus started on his way, a man went up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a young boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Everyone shout loved. loved. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go and sell everything. Go and sell all you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Tonight, let's go to the Father in prayer. And when we go to the Father in prayer tonight, we have to move past the religious action of prayer. We have to move past just bowing our heads and closing our eyes out of religious duty. We have to know that when we talk to the God of the universe, he hears and he responds and he will respond tonight. So with your hands, just put your hands like this and put them on your knees. Just posture yourself to receive from the Lord. And let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for all the ways you powerfully moved tonight. And Father, my sincere prayer is that no person under the sound of my voice today would leave the same way they walked in. Not because of anything I did, not because the message was well prepared or well received, but God, because your Holy Spirit is here. So Holy Spirit of God, do what I cannot. I can't change lives. I can't change minds. But God, in response to your word being preached, I pray that you will. 
Father, I, I pray that you would use me. But God, even if you cannot use me, I, I pray that you would still speak in spite of me. That God, when we leave this place today, we can say, surely we've been in the presence of the Lord. Help us not to quench your Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, give it up for Jesus. I once heard a story. Once heard a story about a man from a very northern state, some God-forsaken country like Minnesota, right? And his and he had to go on a business trip to a luscious, beautiful, warm place like McKinney, Texas, right? He had to go, yeah, he had to go on a business trip and his wife was gonna come with him. And they were all excited to get some time away together, but it just so happened, you know how those things happen, like you plan on something, but then something goes wrong? Well, his wife was supposed to go and, you know, something happened and so she couldn't go. She goes, no, no problem. I'll stay home, I'll take care of this. You go ahead and go down and I'll come up with you tomorrow, uh, but just, just like call me when you get there. That way I know you made it okay. The man said, great, he packed his stuff, he went on an airplane, got all the way to DFW, checked into his hotel, and when he got to the hotel to call his wife, he realized he left his cell phone at home. He left his cell phone at home, and he's like, how, how do I let my wife know that I made it here okay? He's like, I can't remember her number, but I can kind of remember her email address, right? So he pulls up his computer and he types in her email address, and he misses it by one letter. One letter. And the email, instead of going to his wife, ends up going to a recently widowed pastor's wife whose husband just passed away a couple of days prior. And when she read the email, she screamed in horror. She passed out. Her adult children rushed to the room to see what's wrong, and they see their mom passed out, and they look on the screen, and this is what the email read. Ready for it? It said this. Dearest wife, I have just checked in. I am anxiously awaiting your arrival. (laughs) Tomorrow. (laughs) See you soon. Love, your husband. P.S. It sure is hot down here. How many people know, how many people know that almost doesn't cut it, does it? Almost doesn't cut it. You can't send a text message and only get almost the numbers right. You can't send an email and get almost all the letters right. Almost doesn't cut it. Now, what if, what if someone invited you to D now? And this is how you invited them. Hey, you should come to D now with me, right? Our, our church is almost friendly. Our, the worship team almost sings on key. And, and Pastor Matt almost preaches good sermons. You would never invite someone that way. Why? Because almost doesn't cut it, does it? No hunter has on their wall mounted the head of animals they almost killed. No gambler has ever quit their job over winnings they almost won because almost doesn't cut it. And let me just tell you this, as someone who's potty trained a toddler, you know where I'm going with this. There is a world of difference between making it in the potty and almost, come on somebody, just. (laughs) There's a world of difference between almost making it in the potty because almost doesn't cut it. Now, yet so many people are so content with the almost. I'm almost a good student. I'm almost not depressed. I'm almost nice to my siblings. I'm all, I almost honor my mom and dad. It is entirely possible to be so close, yet still so far away. And the saddest state are people who are almost saved. The saddest state of people are the people who are almost saved. I, for years, guys, and trust me to preach the truth to people, whether they like it or not. And I've come to find in my years of talking about Jesus that the hardest people to reach with the gospel 
are the ones who think they already know it. They almost. Almost does not cut it. They may go to church. They may pray. They, they may even live moral lives, but at the core of who they are, Jesus is not their God. He's merely an accessory. And as long as he doesn't require too much of us, we're okay keeping him around. But almost doesn't cut it. There are countless people who are filing for divorce because their wife was almost faithful. There are people who will never hear the gospel because someone almost shared the good news with them. And I'm saying, say it, look at me, look at me, look at me. There are millions of people in hell who almost got saved. Almost does not cut it. Now there's a song I used to sing growing up. I used to grow up in these Pentecostal church and we love to sing hymns. I loved all the songs we did tonight, but nothing gets me like a good hymn. And we just sing a song called, I surrender all. Remember that song? I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. But the song they really should sing is, I surrender almost. I surrender almost. If it's easy, then I'll do it. I surrender almost. But almost doesn't cut it. And the Bible is filled with stories of people who almost obeyed God and it went wrong every single time. I think about in the very beginning of our book, of the Bible, right? There's a couple called Adam and Eve. Who knows about Adam and Eve? They had terrible fashion sense. They're always wearing leaves and things like that. I thought they're tacky, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm glad we got some, you all look dressed tonight. You know, no one came, if you came in wearing a leaf, we politely ask you to leave and get something real that went on, Okay. But Adam and Eve, they were created perfect. They were created innocent. They were placed in a garden and God gave them one rule. Hey, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat it. But Satan deceived Eve and with one bite, they ushered the entire human race into sin, death, and decay. They almost obeyed God. It was only one bite but we're still feeling the effects of that today. I remind him of another story. There's a guy named King Saul. Who's heard about King Saul? And King Saul was the first king of Israel. And God gave, gave uh, King Saul a command to kill the Amalekites. And the Amalekites were wicked. They were absolutely evil. They worshiped false gods. They sacrificed children. I mean, they were, they were wicked. And the Bible says that King Saul killed most, but not all. And because he did not fully obey God, God rejected him as king. If you're taking notes, write this down. Partial obedience is disobedience. Surrendering, not almost, not some, not most, but all. When Jesus walked this earth, there was a group of people called the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were the religious elite of society. They were moral, they were pious, they were fervent. They had laws upon their laws to protect their laws. They knew the word inside, outside, and backwards. Yet when the living word of God who became manifest in the flesh walked among them, they could not even recognize him. They were so close, but still so far away. And there's one guy, there's one story whose story particularly troubles me. You ever, ever, anyone ever hear about a guy named Judas? Do you know that Judas was a good guy? Judas was a good guy. Judas was hand-selected by Jesus to be a part of the 12 apostles. Judas was the CFO, the chief financial officer of Jesus' ministry. Get, now watch this. Judas cast out demons. Judas healed the sick. Yet at the first chance he got, he betrayed our Lord Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He walked with Jesus for three years. He heard all of this teaching. He looked the son of God dead in the eyes and still betrayed him. He was so close, so close he could touch him. So close, he could eat with him. 
so close that Jesus would even wash his feet. Yet he was still so far away. And if I were to walk out of this building today and never get a chance to, to share the word of God with you tonight, and maybe you're like, hey, Pastor Matt, we don't, we don't, we're, we're kind of more into you, like just get us excited about Jesus. Well, let's, let's hear my heart tonight. If I were to share one last thing with you, if I were never to be able to come back to, to D now, to Christ Fellowship Church ever again, here is what I would say. Jesus gave his all for you. Jesus gave his all for you. What did Jesus hold back from you? He traded the prosperity of heaven for the poverty of earth. He traded riches and robes of splendor for garments and flesh and blood. He was crucified for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. He was nailed in his hands and his feet. And it was us who held the hammers. Yet every single drop of blood that he spilled, they cried out in forgiveness to you. And it cried out into forgiveness to me. What did Jesus hold back from you? Jesus gave everything to you. What did, the, what did God hold back from you? The same God who blesses every and all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. What has God held back from you? Jesus gave his all for you. And Jesus is worthy of your all. Jesus is worthy of your all. Everything you have, everything you need is found in him, Jesus is worthy of your all. And there's so many people who are tired, weary, burned out on religion because they almost knew Jesus. They almost knew Jesus. There's maybe people in this room. There's people in this room tonight and we're so good at this, aren't we? We, as human beings, have so broken our heart into pieces and we're stingy about the parts that we give Jesus. Jesus, you can have my Sunday morning, but don't take my Saturday night. Come on, somebody. Jesus, you can have 30 seconds of prayer I give to you before meals, but don't take the three hours that I spend every night watching anime. Jesus, I, I want you to save me. I want you to forgive me. I want to go to heaven, but don't you dare tell me how to live my life. But Jesus is worthy of your all, not just the almost. If Jesus is not Lord of all, Jesus is not Lord at all. If Jesus is not Lord of all, Jesus is not Lord of all, but Jesus is worthy of your all. Jesus is the treasure hidden in the field. Jesus is the pearl of great price. Though it may cost you everything, your pride, your ego, your friends, your family, you have to know Jesus. Though it may cost you everything this world has to offer. Though it may cost you your sanity, it may cost you to drive in humility. You have to know Jesus, why? Because Jesus is worthy of your role. But Pastor Matt, I thought salvation was free. Let me break this lie for a second. Salvation is not free. Nothing that costs the Son of God, the most precious commodity in the universe, his own blood, is not free. Salvation is a gift, but it is not free. Salvation is a gift, but discipleship, following Jesus. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you must take up your own cross and follow me. Salvation is a gift, but discipleship, following Jesus may cost you everything. And let me just say this right now, is that you'll never find one verse in the Bible that calls you to be a Christian, but you'll find many that call you to be disciples. There's a difference between being a Christian and being a disciple. A Christian may show up to church on Sundays, may do the right things, may even give, may even serve, but their heart is not, is not postured to follow, to love, to honor Jesus. But a disciple, as someone says, though none go with me, I still will follow. I have decided to follow Jesus and there is no turning back. And so with the few remaining moments I have for you tonight, in fact, I'm gonna ask Keys, wherever you're at, to come back up and let's prepare for another worship moment. With the few remaining moments I have, I wanna tell you a story about a man who almost followed Jesus. Let's relook at that passage of scripture 
that we read at the beginning. Jesus is teaching, and all of a sudden a man runs up to him. In the Bible, across various gospels, describe him as a rich, young ruler. He's rich. He's got the money, man. He's invested in Bitcoin. He's got, he's got the stocks and the bonds. He's got cash upon cash and stacks upon stacks. He is rich. He's young. He's youthful. His whole life is ahead of him. The whole world is at, he, the whole world is his oyster. He's also a ruler, which he has status and authority. He has everything this world has to offer. Yet in the everything he has to offer, there is still something that he lacks. Because you can have everything the world has to offer. But if you don't have Jesus, it will never be enough. You can have everything the world has to offer. You can have the money, the fame, the status. <laughs> but if you don't have Jesus, it's all worthless. It'll never satisfy because there's a part of your heart that riches will never satisfy. There's a part of your heart that fame will never satisfy. There is a part of your heart that power will never satisfy. There is a part of your heart that can only be satisfied by the fountain of living waters and his name is Jesus. She so runs up to him and says, teacher, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now get this too. Not only did he have the status, the wealth, the youth, he also had revelation. He knew who Jesus was. Because Jesus pointed this out. He goes, you call me good. He, was, he, he had a revelation to know that Jesus is not just a good teacher, not just a moral man, but he was the son of God. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, obey the commandments. And he says, I've obeyed every last one. He's religious. He's obeyed the law as best as he could, but there's a part of your heart that not even religion will satisfy. There's a part of your heart. There's some people in this room right now that you've been walking through this religious stuff and wondering, why am I so dry and empty on the inside? because you can have religion and still not have Jesus. There's a part of his heart that religion couldn't satisfy. And Jesus looked at him and said, there is still one thing that you lack, which is kind of ironic because the one thing he lacked was actually the one thing he had. His God was his money. His God was his riches. He tried to have two gods, but how many people know that you can't have two gods? Either you hate the one and love the other or love the one and hate the other. And Jesus says, go sell all. Everyone shout all. all. Not most. Not some. But all. Go sell all that you have, give to the poor and come follow me. And the rich young ruler looked in the face of Jesus. And in the face of Jesus, he saw hope. And in the face of Jesus, he saw life. And in the face of Jesus, he saw everything his soul cried out for. In the face of, in the face of Jesus, he saw heaven personified. In the face of Jesus, he saw love made manifest in the flesh. In the face of Jesus, he saw everything his heart cried out for. And then he looked at Jesus and looked away and saw all his treasure. And the Bible says that he walked away sad. He was so close, yet still so far away. There's some people in this room tonight, you're so close, but you're still so far away. And I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, give me all and follow me. 
I'm too messy, I'm too broken, I'm too messed up, I, I've made too many mistakes, I'm not religious enough, I'm not all, listen, Jesus doesn't just want your good stuff, he doesn't want your good, he wants your good, your bad, your ugly. If you sin five minutes before walking into church tonight, God wants that too. He wants your mess, he wants who you are. He doesn't want, he doesn't want the fake you. He wants the real you because God can never heal that which you pretend to be. God's not interested in, he in healing your mask. But tonight he said, will you surrender? Not just some, not just most, but will you surrender all? Every part of your heart, the good, the bad, the ugly, the messes, the mistakes, the good days, the bad days, the mountaintops and the valleys, will you surrender all? There's some people in this room, you've been hurt and you've been abused and you've been misused, and you've been holding unforgiveness, wondering, when will I get justice? And I hear the Lord saying, give me that too. I want that too. I want your good days, I want your bad days. Now, scholars and theologians have debated for centuries who this rich young ruler was. Some have said this person, some have said that person. Some have even suggested it was the apostle Paul. But I know who the rich young ruler was. Do you know who he is? Would you like me to tell you? It's me. I'm the rich young ruler. How many times has Jesus presented me the opportunity to surrender all and I've settled for most? How many times has Jesus called me to the deeper things and I was content just doing partway partial obedience, but never giving him my all. I'm the rich young ruler. And maybe you are too. Maybe you've had a moment where Jesus has called you to go deeper, to consecrate the entirety of your life to him. And you said, maybe some other time, Maybe he says, maybe some other day. But don't you dare walk away from this moment right now without surrendering all. And I want to say this too. Host homes, adults, parents, this message was not just for the kids. It's for us too. It's for us too. It's for us too. I had the thought, well, the band's gonna come out in a second. We're gonna sing another song. The spirit of God is moving. He's talking to people right now. He's, con he's convicting people of sin, righteousness, and judgment. In fact, there's some people you feel the tug in your heart saying, I got to surrender all. And you know, normally when you go to a church or they say, hey, everyone bow your heads and close your eyes and raise your hand, right? We're not gonna do that tonight. Look right, look right at me. Look at me in my eyes. Because if you're gonna surrender all, let's surrender our ego first. If you're here tonight and say, Pastor Matt, tonight I'm gonna surrender all. I'm gonna surrender my sin habits. I'm gonna surrender my mistakes. I'm gonna surrender my future. I'm going to surrender who makes the decisions in my life to Jesus. And I'm gonna surrender all of my heart to him. If that's you tonight, with every eye open and every head not bowed, will you raise your hand? Come on. Let's stand to our feet just right now. Let's posture ourselves to, to surrender to heaven. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, you see every sincere heart. You see every person who today is making the decision to not just give some, not just give most, but to surrender all. So Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we consecrate our lives to you. 
Holy Spirit, right now, take every part of our heart. Take, every, take even the parts we don't even know about. Be Lord of them all. On our good days and our bad days, through our hurts and abuses and our mistakes, God, we surrender all. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in power. I pray that you would speak to hearts and minds even right now in the name of Jesus, that today that we would not leave this place today without giving you everything. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's come to the altar right now. Let's come to the altar right now. We don't, I appreciate that, but we don't need to clap. I'm not the one who's, in, who's the Lord's here tonight. I don't want to take any one, I don't want to take any of his glory. Come, come to the altar right now. Let's worship him. Come on, worship him. Give everything to him. Oh. 